Good morning. I'm going to be reading a portion of today's text. We're going to begin in Exodus chapter 19, starting in verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord and look to look, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them, This is the word of the Lord. I told the early service, I'm super excited to begin this series uh, through the Ten Commandments. Uh, you may have been around, if you've been around, you know you've been around Poto or LaFleur County for a while. If you remember the, the big movement to put the Ten Commandments like uh, outside of businesses or in courthouses, you might have put them on your home or maybe you had the bumper sticker on your car. And one of the questions that I heard back then is, What's the big deal with the Ten Commandments? Like, why would you focus on those above every other thing? And while what we believe about Scripture is all God-breathed, it's all inspired by God, there is something unique about the Ten Commandments. So here's kind of what happened. Um, of course, God created the heavens and the earth. You know the story. You had um, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Uh, but at some point, God called Abraham out of the land of his father. He said, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And so he kind of entered into this covenant with Abraham, and they, they began. Abraham began following God. There was Abraham, there was Isaac, and then Jacob. And basically what ended up happening was the Israelite nation uh, was built up and strengthened uh, until they found themselves uh, enslaved in the land of Egypt. You know the story of Joseph and his brothers. That's how they wound up there. But they find themselves enslaved in Egypt, and it was brutal, and it was oppressive. They were owned, and they were slaves. Some of the great um, things that the Egyptians were able to build, they built on the backs of Israelite slave labor. And so the, ultimately, the Israelites, they cry out to God, and God rescues his people. He leads them out of Egypt across the Red Sea, and now they're approaching Mount Sinai. Now, because God has led his people out of slavery and now into a life of freedom, he's going to show them what it looks like to be free, and that's ultimately following God. And so for us, what I want to do is kind of set that stage for you, and I want to answer a couple of questions. What are the Ten Commandments? And why do they matter for us today? Um, by the way, if you weren't here in the early service, sometimes baptisms don't work out even, or you get to see them in both services. Uh, I got to baptize three people this morning. It was just a powerful testimony of what God is doing in the lives of our people. If you've never followed Jesus in believer's baptism, you're a believer, never done that, uh, you can come find me after the service and stop by the Welcome Center. Uh, we got several more coming up, and so uh, we would love to help you take that next step uh, in following Jesus. All right, so back to Ten Commandments. Here is what the Ten Commandments are and why they matter to us. The first, the Ten Commandments are the words of God. And so uh, if you read here in Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, it says, And God spoke all these words, saying... Now, this is one of the only time we know in Scripture where God spoke audibly to somebody. Now, he could have done it otherwise other places, but we know here God spoke these words. Moses had gone up from the people of Israel. He's on top of Mount Sinai. The presence of God had come down, and Moses met him there. There. So when God speaks, we should listen. He's given us his word, right? We should listen and pay attention. Now, um, if, if you're not, it kind of, it's been a modern uh, idea that we call them the Ten Commandments. Uh, other places in Scripture, they'll call them the Ten Words. It's known as what's called the Decalogue. So Deca means ten and Logos words. So these are the ten words of God. In a culture... It says everyone gets to define their own truth. You have your truth and I have my truth. And as a result, we have no truth. We should look to the truth 
of God, to his word, the truth of our creator who created the entire universe to know what is really true. And so uh, the Ten Commandments are the words of God, and therefore we should pay attention. Um, number two, what I want you to know about the Ten Commandments, they are not the path to salvation. Um, it's not one of these deals where if you keep the commandments, right, follow all the things, and one day you'll stand before God, you'll high-five him, and he'll let you into heaven. And, and, and by the same token, if you break the commandments, you will not necessarily be rejected. Um, if you see the Ten Commandments as the law for your life, and if I do this, I'm going to be pleasing to God, and if I don't, he's going to be angry at me, the Ten Commandments will crush you. If you've lived very long at all, and you've breathed on this earth, you have broken the commandments. As a matter of fact, part of their function was to show us that we were not good enough to earn our way to heaven. Like, we couldn't be righteous enough to get there. And part of their job was to point us toward our desperate need for a Savior, right? So, because we broke God's law before Him, and we were sinful before Him, and because God is a perfectly just judge, He could not leave our sin unpunished. But rather than giving us what we deserve, God sent his son Jesus, who lived a perfect, sinless life. He kept all of the commandments, right? And then he went to the cross and endured the punishment we deserved. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, not by keeping commandments. So you might think, so why bother? Why worry about it, right? Um, well, here's number three. First, they're, they're words of God. We pay attention to the commandments. They are the words of God. Um, they are not the path of salvation. But number three, they show us who God is. They begin to reveal his nature and his character, his glory and his majesty to us. The, the law that is written here uh, is a reflection on the law giver. What we see when God says, do not murder, for example, is that our God is a God who values every single life. He values the ones that we would naturally value, those talented people that, you know, rise to the top, they make all the money, they have all the fame, right? But God also values the person who nobody else sees and nobody else cares about. Thou shalt not kill. God values life. Uh, you take, uh, you should not commit adultery. And we see that God is a God who is faithful to his covenants. Even when we're unfaithful to God, he remains faithful to us. And so um, the commandments, they're an expression of God. We know his nature and his character, his essence comes through his commandments. They are not an arbitrary list of do's and don'ts, right? This isn't just something God threw out there uh, just to, you know, see if we could jump through the hoops. But rather they reveal his majesty, his worth, his character to us. To disregard God's law because they are from God, right? They're his words and he's perfect. To disregard God's law is to disregard God. So the commandments matter to us. The, the fourth thing, so they're the words of God. They're not the path to salvation. They show us who God is. And number four, they keep us free. For those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, uh, when, the day that you get saved, right, uh, what doesn't happen is you are magically transformed forever and you never have a sinful desire again and suddenly you just have the full mind of Christ. Um, as a matter of fact, we are going to spend our entire lives growing. The reason we want to make disciples here is that so people will grow up into who they are in Christ Jesus, right? And as such, God has given us his commandments to help keep us free. So think about this. God led the nation of Israel out of the slavery of Egypt and into the freedom. Ultimately, they're headed to the promised land, right? And God has led us out of the slavery of sin, and he set us free in Christ. And so when you read the commandments, you should see them as an invitation to God's abundant life that he has for us. So some people think about the rules of the Bible, the commands of God, and they see them like prison bars, right? And so here we are, we're on the outside looking in. We just want to have fun and live our lives and do what we want, and these prison bars just keep us from experiencing the world. Um, but that's not what the commandments are at all. Rather, commandments, you should see them like guardrails. God has set us free from a life of slavery and destruction due to sin. And he's given us his commandments like guardrails to keep us from going off the cliff and enduring uh, the destructiveness of sin in our lives. And so these are good. God has given them to keep us free. So what are the Ten Commandments and why do we care? 
They're the words of God, so we pay attention. They're not the path of salvation. They show us who God is, and ultimately, they keep us free. If you want to know what the abundant life is, the fullest, richest, most abundant life you could ever live is a life fully surrendered to God and following His Spirit and His Word wherever you go and whatever you do. So the commandments are to us a blessing. All right, so uh, that is the intro for this series. I've been excited to tell you all that because, listen, the Old Testament matters, right? God has given it to reveal himself to us. There's a lot of rich stuff here. So let's dive into this first commandment. Read with me again in chapter 20. We'll start in verse 1. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, before giving us commandments, God first reminds us of who he is and who we are in relation to him. So when he says, I am the Lord, uh, he gives us his name in Hebrew. Now, in the Hebrew, there are no vowels, and, and I'm just going to spell it for you in English the best we can. Uh, the name of God was Y-H-W-H. It's like the sound of breath, yeah, that sort of idea. Now, um, in order for English speakers and people to be able to uh, pronounce his name, we call him Yahweh. That is the name of God. Now, God was very specific. It's not ambiguous. His name is Yahweh. He wanted us to know who he is. Now, Yahweh here... It means he is the sovereign God of the entire world. He is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He is the God of us. He is the God who spoke all that we know and see into existence. Like anything you've ever known and enjoyed and found to be beautiful in this world is ultimately just a tiny little glimmer of God's beauty and majesty. He is a vast and big God. I'm, I'm, a, I'm from the sciences, and I love the sciences. I think they're, they're awesome. But God takes the laws of science, the laws of physics that we cannot change, and he totally, he turns them on their heads because God is not constrained by the laws that govern our world, right? I mean, so the law of conservation of mass. It can't be created. Mass can neither be created nor destroyed. God's like, watch this. And he speaks. And all of creation is formed at the sound of his voice. God is totally and wholly other than we are. Like you think of the most impressive person you've ever met, the most brilliant or talented And it's just a tiny glimmer of God's majesty, of his glory, of his holiness. He is all-powerful. Not pretty powerful, not the strongest guy you've ever known. God is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He knows literally everything happening in the life of every single person, in every single place, all at the same time. And he knows that all day long, right? God is vast in his knowledge, God is all present, right? He's everywhere all at the same time. He is eternal. He has neither beginning nor does he have end. Like God is massive. He is vast. He's majestic and he's worthy. Now, if all we knew about God were, was his magnific- magnificence, right? His worth, his glory. If we just knew that about God, we might have a tendency to want to fear him. What a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God, right? This is Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God, and so we should be fearful. But God doesn't stop there. He's not a big, bad God. Because Anyone have this idea when you were a kid, like God was kind of angry at you? And you're like, I've seen the lightning bolts in the cartoons, and I'm pretty sure I've messed up enough. There's one headed my way. Listen. God is vast. He is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. He is far above any other person or God or thing. But he's not just Yahweh. He gives us another name for himself. He says, I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. But then he says, I am Yahweh Elohim. And it's in the personal possessive. He says, I am the Lord, your God. That great big God who is majestic and ruling and reigning over all creation, who sustains the entire world, everything going on throughout eternity, all at the same time and all by himself. And he doesn't even get tired, right? That's who God is. He also says, I am that Lord. I'm the Lord, your God. He's also a very personal or personal God. For the nation of Israel, he chose them. 
to represent him as his people, to be set apart as the people of God. If you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God has chosen you. And if you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, I want you to know that God knows your name. The scriptures tell us he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows what's going wrong in your life right now. Those difficult and unseen moments where it might feel like you're alone, I want you to know God knows it. He sees it. He's present with you in the midst of that. Um, in Exodus chapter 2, um, we see the, the nation of Israel, they're in slavery in Exodus. Here's what it says in Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 23. It says, During those many days, the king of Egypt died. So a new king uh, is coming into power, right? The king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and I want you to see who God is. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. You know that God hears your prayers. That great, big, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God. He hears your prayers, and he sees your pain. He sees the good moments and the bad moments, the ugly ones, the one where you think, you're like, you're like, you think that you're all alone and no one can understand. God sees God hears and God knows. And the beautiful thing about this is that God heard the prayers of his people and he delivered them out of Israel and demonstrating his power. You think about Egypt. It was a, an extraordinarily powerful nation. Pharaoh was the, the ruler over all. They would worship the Nile as a source of life and the, the sun in a similar fashion. And yet our great big God, uh, when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, hey, I want you to let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I'm not going to submit to the, the Lord our God, right? I'm not going to submit to Yahweh. Who is he? I'm Pharaoh. And God decides to humble him. So the river that they worshipped as a source of life turned to blood and everything in it's dead, right? And then it was frogs and flies and gnats and locusts and a hailstorm that killed every crop that they had. All of their cattle and sheep are gone. And then it was their firstborn children. The Pharaoh who had rebelled against God bowed his knee before God and he said, you can go. And then he changed his mind and he pursued the people, the nation of Israel, and God parted the Red Sea, right, for them to walk across on dry ground. And when the armies of Egypt pursued him, he crushed them as the waters fell back over him. I am Yahweh. I am powerful. I am the Lord, your God. I am a personal God who hears you and sees you and who knows where you are before you even pray it. God knows. And it is this God who is worthy of all glory and honor and praise, who is higher above every other God, every other thing. He exists wholly outside of creation. And he's going to speak his words and tell us how to live before him. In verse 3 of Exodus chapter 20, he says, You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. Now, if, if you're a, a good, you know, we're Bible Belt Americans here. Most of us have ra been raised most of our lives with a monotheistic outlook. So mono is one, right? Theism is this idea of God, theos. One God. That's how we've been raised. If you would have grown up in a Greco-Roman culture, you might have had many gods and thought about, you know, multiple gods. You've got to please each of them in a different season in order to get what you want. Um, we're primarily monotheistic people. And so you might think... Well, good. Commandment number one, got a checkbox there. At least I've never worshipped another god. I've never bowed down at any other altar. I'm not sending money to some other, uh, other god somewhere. Like, okay, I'm good here. And so maybe it would help for us to think about how, how would we violate this commandment? What would it look like for even people that call themselves Christians? How would we violate this commandment? Well, number one, um, way we would mess up here, violate this commandment. I titled this Flirting with Polytheism. Poly means many gods, right? Flirting with polytheism. Now, um, it is imperative in Scripture to be loving and kind, right? That's, that's never negotiable. Like, we're always going to be loving toward people. 
Um, But if we're not careful in our interactions, in particular in this culture, um, we will break the first commandment without even realizing it. So I was a sophomore in college, and I had a a really, really brilliant animal biology professor. Uh, and he was, he was so brilliant, I got to see in the class. So just a little confession there. It was hard. Uh, I did my best. I knew this guy was just unbelievably intelligent. And somewhere along the way, God began to stir in my heart that I needed to go and share the gospel with my professor. And that was super intimidating because I was, you know, 19 years old and I didn't know anything. And so I was just like, I'm going to go in there. So I scheduled an appointment. I go to his office and I began to talk to him about the things of God. And he began to express his faith to me. And he, of course, this happens a lot in the biological sciences. They kind of, if you're not like kind of a um, Darwinian evolution kind of guy, they kind of talk down to you. If you have, you know, faith in God, they're like, oh, you're, you're an idiot. But anyway, he, didn't, he wasn't too bad. But he, was, he basically said, you know what? I'm kind of unique among my peers. I do believe in God. And I believe basically that God's kind of at the top of a very high mountain. And that there are multiple paths to get to the top of that mountain. And so you're here in the name of Jesus And that's one path up the mountain. But someone else may come in the name of Allah or Krishna or Brahma or or the God of pantheism or whatever it might be. Uh, They're all roads lead to the top of the same mountain. So all religions are essentially striving to get to the same place. And so if you'll just kind of, you know, ease up on me a little bit, you'll, you'll see that all the world religions, they all lead to the same place. And what I would say to you, the problem with that is is the Bible. God was very explicit here. There is one God. His name is Yahweh. And you shall have no other gods before him. And sometimes in the midst of our culture, Christians wishing to be kind and accommodating, we can, we can smile and nod, right? Rather than, than speak the truth to people that need to hear it, um, we smile and nod, and in a sense, we give assent, mental assent to this polytheistic idea that maybe um, the God of Islam is, you know, as good as our God. Maybe Buddhism is as good as Christianity. Maybe we shouldn't be so hard on the people around the world, but, um, you know, just embrace their gods too. And the, the problem with that is that there is one true God. All others are false gods. The Apostle Paul um, writing a letter to the church at Corinth. Um, it was an interesting place. So at Corinth, uh, you, you're going to find temples to, or you would have found temples to various gods there in the city. And so there were Gentiles, which means kind of pagan believers who were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And they were going to church with the Jews. So think about the Jews. I mean, they didn't eat uh, pork. They had very specific dietary restrictions. That's what they'd known their whole life. And then you have these Gentiles who have been worshiping at pagan temples. They would offer food sacrifices to them. They would engage in all sorts of things that were worshipped to these false pagan gods. And so then they come to faith in Christ, and uh, you could see there might be some issues between the Jews and the Gentiles. And one of the issues in particular was about eating food that had been sacrificed to idols. The Gentiles were like, what's the big deal? I've been eating my whole life, right? And the Jews are like, you don't eat unclean foods. And this was kind of a thing. And so the Apostle Paul, he writes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and he says, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. It's a mirage. It's a fairy tale. An idol has no real existence, and there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, and he says, indeed, there are many gods and many lords, with lots of people call things God, but there is one God. Period. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And so what he's saying, all things that we see are from God and we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. And what he's telling the church at Corinth there is that all things, all people were created by God. God and for God and for his glory. And God has given us his name. He didn't leave it ambiguous. His name is Yahweh. He is the one true God. And we should ultimately want the nations of this world, no matter what God they were proclaimed to serve, to know the one true God rather than worshiping gods that are not gods. Matter of fact, any other thing, any other person, any other thing before God, it pales in comparison to the one who is eternal, 
who is all powerful, who is all knowing, who is all present, and who is all good. Our God, who is vast and powerful, is our personal God, who is a God of love. And you know the most loving thing we can do for someone who's seeking after God, right? They've probably seen the, the, the intricacy and beauty of creation, and they're, they're clinging for something to call God, but they haven't found the one true God yet. The most loving thing we can do is tell them the truth and point them to the God who has saved us. So one of the ways that we can violate God's command here to have no other gods before him is to flirt with polytheism, is to sit idly by, to smile and nod while people articulate false beliefs in false gods. We speak up. We tell the truth. Um, by the way, this also guards against deism. Y'all know what deism is? Deism is a belief that there is a God, but we, we're not sure who he is, um, and uh, we're not sure that he's very interested with our lives. To be honest with you, I think uh, deism is a lazy man's rejection of God. Because God has been explicit in his word, he can be known. He revealed himself to the nation of Israel and ultimately to us. He told us his name. His name is Yahweh, and he is intimately concerned with our lives. Again, knowing the number of hairs on our head, he knows your name, he knows your thoughts, he knows and he sees and he cares for every one of us. So again, deism is kind of like a lazy man's rejection, but God has been very clear. So the first way that we can violate this commandment flirting with polytheism. The second way, and the, I believe the most common way that you and I would violate this commandment is by acknowledging him as God, but then living our lives as if he isn't. If he is God, he is the most high God, perfect in all of his ways. If he is the one who spoke this world into existence and knit us together in our mother's wombs, who ordered creation that it functions just as he saw fit, then we should probably follow him. If you see the bigness of God, you should also see the smallness of yourself. If you see the perfection of God, you should see the weakness of yourself. And what many times happens for us is we claim him to be God of the universe. And then we act like we are. He is God, but then we go our own ways and we do our own things. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. That's who God is. He, have, he is infinitely better than we are. He is perfect. Our thoughts, our ways, pale in comparison to his. Uh, several years ago when Brian Fields was a pastor here, uh, he, he decides he wants us to do a book as, as a staff. And so he decides we should read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. You've probably heard it. It's a really famous book. And so um, the other thing you may not know about Brian, he's kind of a tightwad. And so he spent some time, not one to waste the church's money, he spent some time searching for the cheapest copies of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People that he could find. And so he finds them somewhere, orders them. And when they get here, they're like this big, like not that thick. The whole book was this tall, right? Little bitty thing. It had the title on the cover, uh, but it was a chief knockoff. Somebody totally took advantage of Brian. And to be honest with you, when we would worship or obey or submit to any idea or philosophy or thing other than God, we are settling for a cheap and empty imitation. There is one true God. And yet for many of us, rather than living our lives in humble submission to God, looking into his word and saying, how would God tell me to live? Because his thoughts are higher and his ways are better. Uh, we just kind of go with what we feel. Right? We do what we want to do. If you've ever heard the person, um, you ever heard someone who's kind of mouthy or rough and they're like, well, this is just who I am, right? That's a declaration of who's on the throne of their life. It doesn't matter how I act or how I respond, right? I do what I want. I am who I am. For many of us, um, the God we listen to is the God of ourselves. Can I ask you some questions? Why do you make the decisions that you make? You know, the big ones and the, the little ones and the ones that happen day to day. Why do you make those decisions? Is it because of what God wants or is it because of what you want? Why do you behave the way that you behave? Is it because what God wants of what God wants or is it because of what you want? 
Why do you spend your money in the way that you spend your money? Is that because that's what God wants, or is it because of what you want? Why do you run the business you way you, the way you run your business or serve as an employee the way that you serve as an employee? Is that because of what God wants or because of what you want? Why do you treat your spouse the way that you treat your spouse or raise your family the way that you've chosen to raise your family? Is that because of what you want or is that because of what God wants? What about your sexuality? Do you practice your sexuality in accordance with what God wants according to his law of freedom? Or you just do what you want? You just give in to your flesh and what feels good? If he's God and we're his people, if he's God and we're not, we should look to him and submit ourselves to his wisdom and to his ways. What about the way you spend your time? Spend it the way that God would want or do you, you know, just kind of do whatever you want? One of the primary ways that we break this first commandment, have no other gods before me, is we claim that God is God, but then we live as if he ultimately isn't. Our God is perfect in all of his ways, and our God is good. In every commandment he's ever given, it's an invitation for us to walk in his abundance, to know the fullest, richest, most satisfying life we could ever live. He's given us his word that we can know who he is and ultimately how he would want us to live. The question that we ask, I tell you, especially you guys out there, over and over and over again, is what does God's word have to say about that? And when we know what God would have us to do, God has given us his Holy Spirit to empower us for righteous living. So the, the question I would want to ask for you today is, um, are you living as if God is God? Are you living before the most high God of the universe in submission to him, or are you going your own way? Um, every week at the end of our service, we, we provide a time of response where we want you to, hey, am I, am I walking in obedience to what I've heard today? Am I honoring God with my life? And, and maybe during this time, you just need to acknowledge areas of your life that haven't been submitted to Christ. Maybe it's your money. Maybe it's your sexuality. Maybe it's how you're treating your family or your coworkers or whatever it might be. And here's the good news. Because of Jesus Christ, those commandments don't have to crush us. Because of the grace of our God, who is compassionate and merciful, um, Jesus has died to make atonement for our sin. So maybe today, if you're a believer here, you just need to confess that sin. The scriptures tell us that God is faithful and just to forgive our, all of our sins, right? To cleanse our unrighteousness. But if you're not a believer today, and you've begun to look at the Ten Commandments, and you realize that your life doesn't measure up, I want you to know you're in good company. What happens for us when we come to faith in Jesus Christ is we stop trusting in ourselves and our own performance, and instead we trust in the work, finished work of Jesus Christ for us on the cross. And so if you don't know Jesus today and he's drawing your heart to him, uh, in just a few minutes I'm going to be right down here, and I would love to visit with you, to share with you uh, wh what the gospel is and, and how we can be saved. So right now I'm going to pray for you, and then I want to invite you to stand and we'll sing. Father, we praise you uh, for your goodness. God, we praise you that you are a God who is in control of everything in all places all at the same time. God, that you're not a God who sleeps, who gets tired. We praise you that you're a God who knows us and who loves us. You're a God who leaves the 99 to seek after the one. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth, that you've revealed yourself to us, that we can know you and ultimately walk with you. And I pray for the person here who's living a life of rebellion against you, maybe just going their own way. Uh, I pray that today would be the day of repentance and they could find your kindness today. For the person who doesn't know you at all, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Father, we, we just commit this to your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now I'm going to ask you to stand and just respond.